Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at a fantastically rare and very cool Iraqi sniper rifle. This is an al qadasiya and it's essentially what you would get if you wanted to build a Draganov, but instead you actually had the tooling to make a Yugoslav M70 pattern AK, which pretty well describes the state of the, the Iraqi weapons industry in the 1980s. Now, a little bit of backstory here. First, al qadasiya is actually the name of a battle. The Battle of al qadasiya took place in current-day Iraq uh, in about the year 636. It was a significant victory for the Arab Islamic forces in the area, and essentially signified the beginning of Arab Islamic rule in Persia. Now, Saddam Hussein, during the course of his rule, really liked to try and tie himself and his image to that of uh, historic Arab victories um, a pan-Arab state, you know, he, he wanted to be the protector of the Islamic Arab communities in the Middle East. So uh, you'll see that on a bunch of his weapon names, and al qadasiya is no exception. Now this was also actually made at the al qadasiya establishment, one of several dozen defense uh, manufacturing facilities that were built during Saddam's rule in Iraq. This particular one is a little bit south of Baghdad, and it specialized in making small arms. In the late 1970s, I think 1979 specifically, uh, Hussein partnered up with the Yugoslavian government for technical assistance, and they built essentially an AK factory, and it was a factory specifically to manufacture copies of the Yugoslav M70 series. This would be known in Iraq as the Tabuk, T-A-B-U-K, and I actually have a previous video uh, that I did with Miles Vining of Silo Report on the Tabuk rifles, which is really cool and you ought to check it out if you haven't seen it before. I'll link to it at the end of this one. One of the Tabuks is kind of, it's called the Tabuk Sniper, and it is essentially a, an AKM, a Yugoslav M70 pattern rifle in 7.62x39 with a very long barrel and a scope rail. But that's not the only sniper rifle that the Iraqi uh, army was using, or the Iraqi government was manufacturing at al qadasiya They also actually made, essentially, a Draganov copy. But like I said, this is based on a facility that was set up to manufacture the Yugoslav M70. So let's go ahead and take a closer look and pull it apart because internally this is not your normal Draganov, and in fact shares no parts compatibility with a Draganov, nor for that matter a Yugoslav M76 or a Romanian PSL. All right, let's start by taking a look at the markings here. We have al Qadasiya. Uh, and by the way, some of the early production ones are actually spelled a little differently, S-I-A-H. Um, there are a couple other transliterations, different spellings for al qadasiya I'll list uh, all of them that I'm aware of down in the description text, but that's how the later production rifles were marked. Then we have the caliber, which is 762 by 54 rimmed, same as the Soviet Draganovs, uh, and made in Iraq. Now, why is this marked in English, you might wonder? Uh, and there are a couple of potential answers. One is that the al qadasiya establishment was offering guns for international sale, for export, as a way to raise hard currency. And marking things in English was in some ways uh, sort of a sign of prestige. It indicated um, more international education, sort of a higher status. A lot of stuff was marked in English um, in the, under the Iraqi government. Next up, we have our serial number here and date of production. So the way that the al qadasiya establishment serial numbers worked, and this applies to the Tabuks as well as these rifles, that the first three digits of the serial number are actually a batch code. So this is the 500 series. You'll see a wide variety of other series marks on Tabuks, often designating different combinations of features, different patterns. The four final digits here are the actual serial production numbers. So I don't think I've ever seen an al qadasiya sniper here with a serial number over 2,000, certainly not over 3,000. Production was very slim. Um, as for production dates, we know these were made from 1988 until 1991, and then there appears to have been a batch made in 2003, just before the U.S. invasion. That serial number is also repeated on the bolt carrier, and back here on the top cover. The al qadasiya can be really hard to distinguish from a, a true Draganov in photos, especially, you know, photos taken from a distance or slightly out of focus. The best feature you can look for to identify them is the magazine because what we have here is compatible, interchangeable, with a Soviet Draganov magazine. But instead of just standard plain reinforcing ribs, the Iraqis put on a palm tree and a saber as reinforcing ribs. Now the magazines are pretty clumsy, like the 
there's some QC issues here. This, there we go. They're tricky to get out and interchange. For what it's worth, the owner of this rifle says he has four of these magazines, and this is the best fitting one. There's your side-by-side -side comparison. There are some differences in the spot riveting and, and some subtle differences, but these are in fact interchangeable magazines. PSL magazines, however, will lock in place, but not actually function in Alcadasias. Next up, I want to take a quick look at the optic. This is a copy of a Yugoslav Zorak M76 scope. Uh, it is mounted on a standard rail, so this will fit any Russian, Chinese uh, optic that will fit a Dragunov, so you'll often see PSO scopes on these, but the official scope for them was the M76. This is a four power scope. We have a Yugoslav serial number here, ONM76 is the, uh, the model name. You'll notice it has a BDC cam for 762 by 54 rimmed. This is the same scope that the Yugoslavs put on the M76, uh, their designated marksman's rifle. The inscription on the top says made in Iraq. It's not entirely clear to me if this was actually made in Iraq or if it is a relabeled Yugoslav production scope. Um, on the Yugoslav scopes, well, this one is clearly missing the little tag that is sort of a, a nuclear uh, warning symbol because these had tritium illumination at one point. The Iraqis did manufacture optics, but they also apparently got some just relabeled from Yugoslavia. Not clear to me which this is. Now, when we start looking at the rifle up close, you'll start to notice a lot of elements that are AK and not Draganov. So the first one that sticks out here is this bulged front trunnion. The Draganov, the true Draganov, is a milled receiver gun, and it does not have rivets up here, and it does not have this strengthening bulge to it. These are representative of the Yugoslav M70 series of AKs, which had reinforced front trunnions just like that. If we go to the back, we can see the same thing. We've got a riveted on rear trunnion here. The buttstock is very similar to the design of a Draganov buttstock with a few differences. It has a really actually sharp corner at the back here, which is rather uncomfortable, would definitely be uncomfortable in shooting. It's a fairly short length of pull, surprisingly and to me uncomfortably short. There is a plain rubber butt pad on the back. You do not generally see them with cheek rests here, and I'm not sure if this is an authentic Iraqi one, or if it has been taken off of a Draganov or an NDM-86 and put on here. If you look, the latch doesn't actually fit. Uh, you should pull this all the way back to lock it in place. Instead, it barely fits on in the open position, and the lacquered wood here looks much more like uh, a true Draganov than Iraqi production. Disassembly is going to be basically the same as a real Draganov. We're going to rotate this disassembly lever all the way back, which will allow us to pull off the top cover. The top cover has a pivoting in uh, recoil spring guide and a two-part recoil spring. You can see there's a lug here, and this locking bar is what actually holds the top cover in place. I can then pull the bolt carrier back, I'll lift that out. Then we're going to lift the safety up. By the way, I didn't mention it, but we have Arabic markings here for safe and uh, single fire. If I lift this up, there we go, that safety lever pops out. And then we can pull the back of the trigger guard down and the whole fire control unit comes out as a unit, just like a real Dragunov. We have a handguard retainer up at the front here. I'm going to push that in and rotate it down. And then I can slide the handguard retainer forward. Then, like a Draganov, it has a two-part handguard. Take those off. And then we have a short stroke gas piston system here where Gas is tapped off the barrel here, comes into this tube, it's going to push this piston back. There's the vent hole, so once it moves all the way back, excess gas vents out. That short stroke piston comes back here through the rear sight block and hits the front of the bolt carrier right there. You can see the discolored spot. So this is a system just like the Draganov, except the Draganov has an adjustable gas port the Alcadasia does not, it has one fixed gas setting. And then we also have a Draganov style muzzle device here, which is 
like the real Dragunov, this is threaded, uh, left hand threaded on. And there's quite a lot of threading in there. There we go. There's the muzzle device. And we can go ahead and take the gas system apart. Pull this part of the piston out. Then lift up this latch and we can unscrew this section of the piston. There we go. That comes out. And then the gas piston itself and its return spring come out. Now at the beginning I mentioned that this is essentially a Dragunov made on AK tooling. And so let's take a look at all the various features. Right up at the front we have essentially an AK front sight tower. AK front sight, that is not a Dragunov. Um, it's important to remember that the Dragunov is not an AK derivative. It was designed completely independently. And so even the, the parts that you know could theoretically interchange between the two designs were designed and built independently and they're not the same. So a Dragunov front sight you can tell them because they're fully hooded, among other things, is not an AK site. This is an AK site. The gas block is unique, of course, because it's got a short stroke gas piston system instead of the long stroke of an AK. Now, when we get back here to the front trunnion, you can see that this is very similar to a standard AK front trunnion, in particular a Yugoslav M70 front trunnion. We've got our rear sight block here, also looks very AK-like, rear sight leaf, very much an AK rear sight leaf. Uh, and a trunnion here that is riveted onto a stamped sheet metal receiver. That's how the M70 was built, or at least the, the stamped M70s that the Iraqis were making. If we take a look at the bolt, this is clearly the carrier from a Dragunov, but our bolt is essentially an AK bolt. It actually rotates the opposite direction as the Dragunov, and that's because it has a cam cut that is essentially an AK uh, operating cam. Uh, you can see here, by the way, they've got, they've reduced the inside diameter to reduce weight and to give a place for gunk and sand to stay out of the way. But this operates just like an AK. Uh, rotates and locks like an AK, not like a Dragunov. Back here we have the rear trunnion that the stock is screwed into. There's a screw there, and there is a screw on the bottom of the pistol grip. By the way, this red uh, pistol grip cap is distinctive and unique to the Alcadasia. They put it on basically all of them. Not really sure why. It is plastic. It might be there to protect the toe of the, the bottom of the pistol grip there. If it's not that, then frankly I'm not sure what its purpose is. But what's interesting is that the rear trunnion is actually riveted, you can see it right here on the inside, the rear trunnion itself is riveted to a reinforcing plate, or rather a pair of them, one on each side, which are then in turn riveted to the actual receiver. So why they didn't just have a single, like an AK style rear trunnion and a rear, you know, and have the receiver come all the way back, uh, not entirely clear to me, but I'll tell you what my guess would be. My guess would be that the stamping tooling that Al Qadasiya had was designed for an AK, and this is about as long as they could make it. And so without having to get new tooling, uh, the only way they could make a longer receiver like this was to make the back of it as a separate piece. Quick look at the fire control group here. It is, of course, hammer fired. There's our hammer, uh, just like the Dragunov. And like the original correct proper Dragunovs, it actually has a safety sear. So this is the safety sear. Until the bolt pushes that down, the hammer can't drop. So that ensures that the gun does not fire out of battery. Now, in some designs, that is intended to, that is a, an essential component of a full auto fire control mechanism. I do not want the hammer to come out here. There we go. Got our hammer pin coming a little bit loose there. Uh, can't happen when it's in the gun because the receiver holds that in place. But anyway, um, in some designs, this safety sear is actually an auto sear so that it will automatically release the hammer when this is pushed down by the bolt. The Dragunov is one of those semi-automatic only designs that only ever was designed to be semi-automatic that uses this to ensure the gun doesn't fire out of battery. And it's held in the gun by these two hooks that lock onto this. This little guy right here is the bolt hold open. It is spring-loaded. And when this tab on the back of the magazine, which is connected to the follower, when it pushes up, 
it pushes this tab up, which interferes with the bolt and locks the bolt open. So that's how Dragunov's lock open, um, which AKs do not. And there you go, there is a disassembled Iraqi al Qadassiyah, uh, minus the bit of the muzzle that I couldn't quite fit into the shot. One of the interesting things about Tabuk production, and by extension al Qadassiyah production, is that these weapons were often as much for status as they were for formal military equipment. The Iraqis never manufactured nearly enough Tabuk rifles to actually fully equip the Iraqi army. They, Saddam, wanted to have the prestige of having his own domestic arms industry, but it was expensive, there were quality control issues at al Qadassiyah, and it was a lot cheaper to just buy surplus AKs from elsewhere around the world. And so the majority of the Iraqi army was actually armed with a mixture of uh, Romanian, Hungarian, Russian, Chinese, Polish, and other surplus AKs and AKMs. The Tabuks only equipped a limited number of typically higher status units, like guys in the Republican Guard. The al Qadassiyah sniper rifles are the same way. It's not like every unit had its own dedicated marksman with an Iraqi Dragunov. Instead, the majority of these rifles, if we judge from the known surviving examples, appear to be gold-plated presentation guns, and that was definitely a significant element of production. Um, it's also worth pointing out that there are a batch of these guns that appear to have been made in 2003 that are marked with a little plaque inside the stock here and marked on the receiver side with the word training. But it's written in Arabic, and so if you don't speak Arabic or if you don't read it, you're not going to be able to recognize what that phrase is, and you might have a whoopsie, which actually happened a number of times in Iraq uh, with coalition troops, test firing guns that looked like this, but they had this neat little plaque on them, uh, which proceeded to explode when fired, and it's because they are essentially the equivalent of drill purpose guns. They're training only guns, and there was actually a hole drilled in the barrel, but underneath the handguard where it's not immediately visible. And so this is the sort of thing where if you're an Iraqi soldier, you look at this and you go, oh, it says training right on it. I probably shouldn't fire that. But if you're an American or a British or other coalition soldier and you pick it up and you're like, oh, hey, it's an Iraqi sniper rifle. Let's see how it shoots. Kablooey blows the handguard apart and hopefully not your hand with it. So something to be aware of on these. Uh, the gold-plated guns, as I said, do appear to be actually a small minority of the surviving examples. Part of that is probably a bias that people are more likely to hang on to a gold-plated rifle than a standard-looking one, but we can tell just from these numbers, even if they are biased, that there was a substantial production of these specifically made as gifts and presentations and sort of honor guns instead of standard-issue rifles. So uh, a big thanks to the viewer who sent me this one on loan so that I could film it for you. The, the total number of these that survive is tiny couple dozen at most. Something like, uh, if you go and look at uh, Miles Vining's Silo Report uh, article on these, he has something like 15 known examples, uh, not including this one. So this is another one in his list. At any rate, uh, very cool to get a chance to take a look at this. These are very hard to find today. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.